And that's, you know, that's great, you know, but, but equally, uh, th th they need to learn how to see improvement and how to be better and how to learn skills. And, and sport's got so many wonderful parallels in, in life about discipline. And, you know, I've got twin boys now who are, who are four. So trying to teach twin boys who are becoming <laughs> competitive and you're like, you know, look, not everything has to be a race. And they... they <laughs> <laughs> And they, that's really they, believable they look coming at you from and you. Go, yeah, right, Dad. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Now, one of the things um, that is wonderful about this Olympics um, that you pointed out, uh, Tessa, is that it's not just about the sport; it's also about the culture. And again, um, Tony, can you talk a little bit about really what is going to set this apart? Because it is the aspirational um, Olympiad to and all Olympiads well, on the cultural completely. side. I mean, I think um, Tessa's um, speech was, was uh, both inspiring and also highly persuasive. I know Tessa was very persuasive because last summer she persuaded me to take on the cultural Olympiad, <laughs> um, and, uh, and I did. Um, but I think it's really interesting listening to, to, to all the speakers, actually, because the parallels between arts and culture and sport, people often say to me, actually, arts and culture alongside Olympiad, what's, what's all that about? And you can go back to the de Coubertin vision and all of that stuff, but actually, viscerally, the similarities are, are huge. And when Matt was talking about aspiration and that sort of inspiration, I, and you know, I've spent some time recently in, in schools myself where we've been um, either through the Cultural Olympiad or uh, through my, my day job, as it were, I've been um, working with um, young students. Um, sometimes they want to become dancers or singers or actors or, or, or in some ways enter into sort of you know, the creative industries. Sometimes it's doing things which are, you know, you know backstage skills to do with, um, you know, costumes or set design or, or all these sort of things. And what really comes over is exactly what you were saying. It's that, that desire to do things which are really special um, um, and r really do inspire them. And, you know, you look around at awful lot of areas, uh, uh, and, you know, I've been working in one area where 8% of the young people would go into higher education, 8%. But if you work in those sort of areas, you can give inspiration and a sort of and, and, and a real spark. And I think that's what we, working alongside the, the, the sporting part of the Olympics, can deliver. That's one. But the other thing is, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for us to um, sing, dance, um, perform as loudly as the sports people will, um, and say just how very good arts and culture um, are in this country, because we are really good at it. I know it's on British to say that, but it, we really are very, <laughs> very good. And I think if you look back to Beijing or look forward to uh, Rio, which no doubt will be about dance and God knows what else, but the thing which can really, <laughs> really, I think, set us apart is showing off just what an amazing cultural life uh, we have in this country, because we really do. You know, I have to agree with that, having uh, come from the um, opening ceremonies in Vancouver. Mm. Um, it showed off the country, the city, um, culturally, as well as with the sports um, element as well. And, and interesting, sorry, to, just on that point, if yeah. you go back to the last time London hosted an Olympic Games in 1948, there were medals awarded for art, for sculpture, yeah. for yeah. architecture, yeah. Uh, and that is very much part of the Olympic movement. Yeah. And also, just on the female point, I think that the maximum distance a woman was allowed to run in 1948 was 400 metres. I don't think they were allowed to run further, and I'm sure that's right. Well, that's true. And they certainly weren't allowed to run a marathon. So we have come a very, very long way. <laughs> just have in those terms. Um, <laughs> and just on, on a slight tangential point, I think something that the cultural Olympics might be able to teach sport is that homophobia is completely unacceptable because mm. in the arts and in dance and in you know the, the cultural world homophobia barely exists anymore mm. in sport it really does and it's a big problem and actually on a female mm. point it's quite an interesting subject that's never really been tackled by anyone in sport that sport is quite attractive to gay women and is that a you know why is that considered a dangerous thing it's not considered a dangerous thing that ballet is quite attractive to gay men you know and it, right. I think that's a big, big jump really forward that may, that, may come, mm. that may eventually come. Mm. I don't know. So there's a number of different things. And again, um, I guess one question that I would put to the panel before we open it up for all of you is um, we're all inspired. We all want this to be wonderful. What are some of the pitfalls that we need to be focused on in case something goes wrong? What would it be? And what should we be doing now? And what are you doing now to ensure that we don't have something that is 
meant to be great turn in to be not so great? Let me have um, a go at that. Uh, I just... <laughs> I feel I know too well what the risks are. <laughs> <laughs> I can go through the next two and a half years. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I feel I kind of know the Olympics like one of my children, you know what I mean? It's just, um, I, I think that, uh, I think the big risk is somehow that we don't succeed in engaging everybody around the country. And that somehow, at some point, a public, um, belief settles that this is London's and it belongs to somebody else and that's you know that's why we're trying to throw open this uh, this challenge and really say come and you know c this is yours too uh, and I think that that getting that right over the next uh, two years is going to be incredibly important and I think that you know the cultural Olympiad is going to be very very important in that so I think uh, I mean I, I, I actually think that that is the is the great risk and that um, the public support for the games which has been so resilient and such an expression of the optimism of British people um, somehow is um, is is dented. There are then uh, you know that you know I think security is going to be a big challenge until the games are over. Of course it is, but we know that, and we're planning uh, and we're planning for that. Um, you know we um, we could uh, we we could find ourselves with the equivalent of um, actually we did spend a lot of time in Vancouver thinking what's the equivalent for London 2012 of the warmest February ever on record and no snow for the Winter Olympics. Snow well, in London. There's snow in London. <laughs> snow in London. Exactly. Well, I mean, you know, something like that. But all these, you know, all these kind of things you work through. But I think in terms of the essence of what it is we're trying to achieve, it is, um, it is this sense of national reach and also uh, people believing that and really believing that there is a proper place for them. Excellent. Any other comments from the panel before we open up for questions? Uh, attendance, I think, is the other huge issue uh, for, for, the, for the events that aren't the grandstand events and making sure that particularly kids in schools, because that's the, that's the promise, have the chance to go to Olympic and Paralympic events. One of the huge successes in Beijing at the Paralympics, actually, was the attendance in the bird's nest. I, I, it was full. Yeah. And it was full because an awful lot of people in China could get tickets to the Paralympics when they couldn't to the Olympics. And I think that's really important that it's, that chance is there for, for every event to be packed because there are so many people who want to be there and they just need to be able to get the tickets. Um, I'd like to see, uh, um, when, you, when we look back in 20 years' time or 30 years' time, we see on any number of fronts that London was a kind of a changing yeah, part. Changing. Not, I think, I think the sports argument, the purely kind of the way elite sport and, and school sport would be treated, I think that's kind of easy. Um, but I'd like to be assured that that's going to be delivered. Um, I'd like to see the way that London looks at itself change mm -hmm. forever. Because I, I get bored with London being cynical about, you know, London inhabitants being cynical about London. I think that's pointless. And, and why we hold our own capital city in a lower regard than it's held by the rest of the world it's just extraordinary to me. Um, and, you know, I think, I think the, 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 the Paralympics, I'd like to see that have a permanent step change and big move forward. Um, and, and just general enthusiasm about being British, <laughs> which I think, again, you know, it's, it's, we, we, we spent too long kind of in the doldrums being, you know, not being proud to be British, and I'd like to see that change permanently. Excellent. Mine would Tony. be um, East London. Um, I, I, um, I know sort of New York quite well because I've uh, chaired a theatre out there and, and I've done all sorts of other things as well. And I think the ambition of having the East End recognised um, not only for the Lee Valley and the extraordinary veneration of the Lee Valley, I mean, it's going to be really, really beautiful, but also for that sense of creativity which there is in East London. I mean, it is an extraordinary uh, uh, mix of energy and ideas and useful energy and ideas. And to find a way of that becoming the way we see the East End and the five boroughs in London, 
um, after 2012, um, I think would be great. We've got an idea for a big fest building on a festival idea over there, but really making something which is a 